section we're starting to look at, which is part of process monitoring. Because that hints at what process monitoring about is about, which is about tracking the process, making sure that the process is stable. <coughs> so let's, uh, let's switch to those notes. Exactly the same idea, 
is what is the closest monitoring. Some sort of pattern in the data indicates the fault. Stock market charts for those of you that are dealing with intraday, intraday trading or even day-to-day -day trading, you can see sort of technical analysis, this term technical analysis is used in the stock market trades to make decisions on buying versus selling. So the same thing is, is can be considered here. Um, any of you that have walked into a control room in a manufacturing facility has seen the control shop. And we hope in two, three years' time to have Excel building generating its data. Um, I'm kind of responsible for the data collection software. We're going to be collecting data on about a thousand sensors in that building and using that in full scene in future years to analyze and build monitoring charts. But that building's not ready yet, so we're going to build monitoring charts on other data sets. So here's a couple of examples. I won't go through them. The main thing I want to emphasize at this point that's kind of cut off here halfway is that process monitoring is a reactive <laughs> strategy. It means you react to the problem. It's not a proactive. Proactive would be something like feed forward. You're predicting that something's going to happen. You fix it before it's a problem. Process monitoring charts, you have to see the problem in the data first and then react to it. It's a reactive strategy. But because it's reactive, it's really good suited to incremental process improvements. I'll show you how we do that. Over the next uh, two, three classes, we're going to be hearing terms like sure charts, cumulative sum charts, EWMA. Anyone from business school built an EWMA charts? Okay, you have to leave the university degree at least knowing what the EWMA chart is. It's probably the most efficient predictor of the future one step ahead you will ever encounter. So we'll look at EWMA charts and then process capabilities. So six sigma. Who's heard of six sigma? Yeah, so that's all that type of thing. So let's take a look at um, so this. If you're looking for textbooks, uh, here's some topics you might consider. And let's think back to that first section of the course where I said you were supposed to be speaking about quality. Quality in the process is not an option. We're starting to see customers become very particular about quality. And this way of process monitoring ties up with Six Sigma quality thinking so that you produce a consistent product. That's the, that's the only thing this section is about. One word, consistency. That's all we care for is consistency. So how do we, how do we try to go about that? Well, here's a control chart. And a control chart is simply just a time series plot. So in fact, to visualization, you look at time series plots. Here, I'm plotting the temperature of a controller, 241, the Central Canada's plot in Mississauga, before it was closed down. So there's the temperature on the installation column being tracked. And as long as it stays between a lower control level and an upper control level, we don't touch the process. Engineers and operators love to sit at the control desk and tweak knobs and change things up and down. And they do that thinking that they're doing work. But they're often changing the process. By changing anything on the process, you're introducing variability. We, don't, we accept that as an engineer. If you change an input onto a process, you're adding variability. You're changing the manipulated variable. You're going to change something on the process. What control charts do is they say as long as you're within the upper bound and the lower bound, don't touch the system. Everything is behaving okay. So we need three things from this. We need a lower bound, we need an upper bound, and we need a target. And maybe a fourth thing is we need some rules to tell us when should we start touching the process. So the, the most the easiest rule is only touch the process once you deviate out of the bounds. Let me take a look uh, and share an example. This was some work that a colleague and I had done up in Quebec. This was back in 2003, I think it was. We were looking at a flotation cell, and many of you are familiar with the flotation cell. It's simply a container where we have bubbles and froth. And we're looking at that frog with the camera system. So over there, the camera system is some lighting, and that signal from the camera is sent to a computer that processes.
processes the digital image. Uh, let me see if I've got some of those images available. I'd like to show them to you. Okay, so it's not a very pretty surface here. It's a zinc, semi flotation, and we're looking at the bubble size. What we do is we can put some computer algorithms onto this digital image. The computer algorithm will calculate for us several things, one of which is the average color of the image, and the another is the average bubble size. So these uh, bubbles don't look particularly uh, well separated, but as we go through the froth over time, you can see these bubbles becoming smaller and bigger. We're interested in two things, the average bubble size and the variance standard deviation of bubble size. Now I've sat at, at an installation home with an operator who's looked at it and he's detected change in bubble size and to me it looks the same. Operators that work on these processes become very experienced and pick up slight deviations in color and then can relate that back to a problem in the process and try to fix it. So this work was an attempt to try and replicate what the operator does. And here I'll show you some of the results from that. Um, so here's the process is operating and we're measuring the bubble diameter in millimeters. And down here we're measuring the average color of the bubble. The average color of the bubble is specified as a number between 0 and 255. Um, so here we're tracking an average of 50. And the rule is, now this is speeded up very, very fast. Each of these points is 10 seconds apart in time. So I'm accelerating the process a bit. And the rule is, as long as this data looks as it is here on the board, we don't have to change anything in the process. But right around here, you see a problem that's starting to occur. That bubble diameter has started to go smaller. We're down to 10 millimeters now. And our average color is much more variable than the outside the lines. That's when you take action. As long as you behave, as long as our process is in the lines, we don't do anything. So we set that back again. You might see odd points just outside the line. There's none here at the moment. If we wait a little bit, we'll see a few points every so often go out of the line. Even though those are okay, they're kind of like little false alarms. We don't just pay attention to them. But the moment we see a systematic trend, that's when we take action.
control, the feedback control, your manipulated variable is always taking some sort of action. With process monitoring, your actions are very infrequent. With process control, your process actions are all the time, every cycle. With process monitoring, SPC, you're taking action manually. You go and investigate the problem and you fix the problem, and it's a manual change you make in the process. It's not an automatic change. Okay, so that's, there's a very clear distinction between process monitoring and feedback control. Okay, so let's bear that in mind. The other thing that I want you to bear in mind is, and this is the part that people actually forget, with process monitoring. Let's go back to this example over here. You see the temperature rise, we deviate. And if I show you a few more samples, you'll see we're outside the limit. The purpose of process monitoring is that you go figure out why that event occurred, and you put systems in place to prevent it from ever happening again. If you simply detect that event occurred and you figure out why, you've only done half the work. It's no good figuring out the event occurred and why it occurred. That's not going to improve your quality in your process. The only way you will improve the quality in your process is if you figure out what can you go do to prevent that from ever occurring again. If you don't take that last step, you actually will never see the improvements in your quality. This is why the Japanese car manufacturers and the Korean car manufacturers have been far more successful than North American car manufacturers. If you look at the quality systems in place at Toyota, for example, Toyota very publicly shares their quality processes. You'll see a distinct emphasis on fixing up the process to avoid the reoccurrence of the problem. Okay. Many North American manufacturers are content and happy to simply fix the problem and make it go away and hope that it never happens again. But those manufacturers that actually leave their markets spend time and money making sure that the problem doesn't come back. Okay, so that's, that's the, full feed, the full process. Not only to detect the problem, but actually to fix it up permanently. Okay, so that permanent adjustment is a critical part of the system. Okay, so let's, t let's, uh, let's take a little bit of time here to discuss some if you were working in one of those six areas, waste monitoring, pharmaceutical manufacturing, oil and gas, food processing, minerals processing, plastics processing, take a minute to talk to the person next to you, pick one of those six areas, or pick two of them if you've got time, and tell me, just make a list on the paper, what would you want?
meat manufacturer. They want to pick foods. Yeah. Suggestions of what you might want. <coughs> the 
leaching circuit or your flotation cell, uh, reagent addition. The amount of reagents addition, yeah. Okay, so mass, again, over there, or amount of reagent addition. If you're drying your particles, both in minerals and in pharmaceuticals, they dry their solids eventually. So the same moisture. So typically at the end of the flow sheet, the percent moisture is a critical variable to monitoring trying to judge. Let's uh, quickly do water processing. Just shout out a few variables that are important to water treatment. And uh, total suspended solids. Anything else? Dissolved well, oxygen, pH. DOD, composition, turbidity, a lot of those variables are correlated and related up to each other. So what you've done in that, in that exercise is done with equal A0, figuring out which variable to monitor. Wednesday's class will show how to set up one.